Hello and you're very welcome to The Week That Really Was with John McGurk and Sarah Ryan for this April Fool's Week, ending the 5th of April 2024. Sarah, before I say hello, I want to propose a new name for the podcast. Go. This was inspired by a commenter called Neil Radley, 7325, who uh, called our last podcast, quote, two stuttering wafflers who say nothing. I think that's a catchy name. That's nice. Thanks, buddy. Um, I mean, I you know, the waffle, certainly, but I don't have a stutter, I don't think. Although more criticism like that might cause me to develop one. How have you been? Yeah, I, I'm not a waffler either, but I do kind of get, I do stumble over my words a bit sometimes, but that's just because sometimes when we record the podcast, it's eight o'clock at night and I have three kids. So sorry, buddy. Yeah, uh, we'll forgive you. Um, anyway, what we want to talk about this week, we've loads of things to talk about. The government has a whole rake of new advisors, or Simon Harris does at least. There's a new report today about the cost of United Ireland. Um, Donald Trump is sort of, you know, he's doing loads of interesting things in his campaign. We'll talk about that. But we will start, I think, Sarah, with um, Joanne Kathleen Rowling and the uh, state of the Scottish hate speech law, which has been brought in, because it's obviously relevant to things happening in Ireland. Were you inspired by her activity this week? It was great, wasn't it? Mm. I just thought, what a woman. I said it before on the podcast that, like, because she's, and this is what drives them all mad, she's she's uncancelable. She's got the money. She's famous. She doesn't care. And she's doing something really really brave for women um and people in general and the future um by basically coming out against their hate speech laws daring the police to to arrest her and the fact that they've come out and have and and she dared them to put, to arrest her on social media and um they've come out and said they're that they're not going to arrest her and she she's you know it's a, it seems like a small thing but she's had this big big win and it has implications for our hate speech law but it's really important that it sets a line in the sa- it sets a precedent that a woman who says that a biological man is not a woman is not committing a crime. And it's strange that I have to say that, but up until recently, that was a concern. Um, I just thought, w- watching her do it, I thought it was genius because there's no way they're going to arrest her because it was it was real heads you win tails you know heads I win tails you lose uh, yeah. approach because the the position she put the Scottish government in on the very day that they had announced this hate speech bill was they could either arrest and prosecute one of the most famous authors in the world for saying that a man can't be a woman and try and imprison her, thus bringing the wrath of millions of people around the world on top of their heads. Or, on the other hand, they could not prosecute her, thus taking the entire teeth out of the law that was that was passed. Um, so as 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 a, as a strategic move, it was absolute genius. That's the first thing to say about it. Um, and the second thing about it is, I mean, just it's it's not. I actually for that, I I don't really think it was courageous what she did. But I I I I'm filled with admiration for the. I still think it took balls in a way because while she might not pay a legal price, it should not be forgotten that this woman is paying an immense sort of cultural price. And there are there are an awful lot of people out there. I mean, forget about the law. She's not in danger from the law, but she is in danger from a significant proportion of the world's lunatics who who now actively want to see harm done to her. And you only have to read her Twitter replies to see that. Um, and that's a different kind of courage and one that should be remarked on, I think. Because I think it's the one that most people lack. Most people, I don't think, are afraid of the law. It's social disapproval that terrifies them. Um, it, it's the... Yeah, yeah, it's it's the it's the sense that it's a sense that you might not be welcome in polite society again. You might lose friends. You might lose you might lose social standing from saying something you know that's a bit edgy or a bit unpopular. That's what she's really challenging, I think, as much as the law, and saying, "Look, I'm one of the most famous and well-known women in the world, and these are my views." And in so doing, she's inspiring others in a way that you or I couldn't. I mean, I have no problem saying what she said, but like nobody's going to go, oh, well, John McGurk's saying it uh, or Sarah Ryan's saying it, therefore I can say it. Uh, J.K. Rowling is, is is setting an example for a lot of people out there who fear a kind of social backlash. But just as well, like for people who might not understand or might have, might have seen it, that one of the tweets in question that she was potentially going to be arrested for was one where she criticised transgender rapist Isla Bryson, who was jailed for eight years for attacks on two women. When he was a man, yeah, he's still a man. He's a rapist who's once they want to put into an all. He, he was housed at an all-female prison following a double rape conviction. I mean, get in the sea. 
honestly, that is like something that's like something made up. If you read it in a book 10 years ago, you would say it was stupid. <laughs> so like these are things. But it's, it, it, you know, it would be funny if it wasn't so serious, like the implications of that, that people would go along with this and agree and nod like nodding dogs, be afraid of their lives of saying anything about something where a rapist is being put in with women. Well, it shows how far we've come. Um, and it shows, I think, this increasing gulf that is the theme of so many of our conversations on this podcast and will indeed, as we move into talking about political advisors, be the theme of this just emerging gulf between the sort of political class. I don't even want to say politicians because I don't think politicians are, are even making many of the decisions at the moment. The political class and the people that they govern. Um, because I think all the polling in Scotland, Scotland showed that this bill was deeply unpopular and the SNP pursued it anyway. Um, for no clear electoral reasons, just because they, they kind of felt that this was just the next thing that you do. It's the next liberal thing. It's the next progressive. It's the next woke thing. And... Um, and it just exposes this massive gulf because, I mean, there there is no country in the world where this kind of issue has been polled, where where a majority of people agree with putting a rapist in a women's prison. It just doesn't happen. But the problem in Western democracy, Ireland is one example, but there are loads of others ranging from California to Scotland to parts of Australia, where you have people ruling the country who no longer care about public opinion. Um, because in large cases, they're, they're not really subjected to the voters. No one is ever going to vote on the next president of the National Women's Council of Ireland or Amnesty International or, you know, the chancellorship of Edinburgh University or whoever the people are who are influencing the politicians. So so there's this gulf emerging between public opinion and decision making that, um, that it takes somebody like J.K. Rowling to really expose. So do you think then that it will have any implications on our hate speech bill or do you think they'll just continue along? Because- uh, yeah, look, I've said since the start of this year, our hate speech bill is deader than a dodo. But the, the only problem is that our politicians can't bring themselves to admit it uh, publicly. I mean, I was talking, I had a 45 minute conversation this week and I wish, one of those conversations there, I, I don't know if you've ever been on a phone call with somebody and kind of wished in a good way, not in a sort of nasty way, that you could record the call and publish it. But I, yeah. I had a 45 minute conversation today, th- this week, with a senior politician. I can't say any more than that, except to say that he's not in ministerial office. Um, and I wish I could have recorded it, uh, where he basically said, look, everyone knows this is dead. It's not going anywhere. Um, the problem is that they kind of feel it would be a, a, an admission of defeat to admit it. So the, the strategy is to let it die quietly. Um, it's 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 not going anywhere for the simple reason that it is deeply unpopular, and politicians are actually getting stopped on the street and being told that it's deeply unpopular. When that happens, politicians wake up, but it doesn't happen enough. It's just that the hate speech bill has kind of cut through in Ireland. So, um, I would stake my house, my car, um, and everything else I own that the, there will be no hate speech bill passed into law in Ireland this year, uh, or certainly before the next election. And after that, we'll have to see. But you know. It, it, it's it's not going to happen, but, you know, unless Simon Harris is literally insane. Well, I'm very happy with your optimism, um, and like I hope you're right. But I would have thought that you know, as somebody entering the office of Taoiseach in the way that he is, and taking over Fianna Gael and talking, as we spoke about on the podcast last time, talking about you know change or whatever, and he's certainly starting to make noise around the things I thought he might like law and order. I thought that he would just kill it dead in his first day and be done with it. And it's not going to damage him personally, because as you said last time, he'll never be as strong as he is on that day. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the fact that he's come out and kind of said, no, we are going ahead with it seemed really stupid politically, you know, like what? Why would you do that? Well, I do think it's really stupid politically. Um, I do, but at the same time, I mean, bear in mind he's a, he's a lead, and I'm, I don't deeper. I, the last thing I want to sound like is I'm doing PR for Simon Harris. I, yeah, I've no interest in defending him, but he is the leader of a coalition of three parties. So I presume the you know it's it's one of those things that you just say, oh yeah, it's definitely something we're working on. And I mean, this happens all the time with with, with bills and laws. They yeah. go like you you quietly slowly stop talking about them over time, and they go away and die. Um, and, and that's what's happening here. This bill hasn't seen the inside of a parliamentary chamber in Ireland since last July or June or something, before the summer break last year. It's been nine months, and it was, t- it was taken away then on the understanding that there were going to be amendments proposed to it. 
uh, by the Minister for Justice, who would bring it back, quote, early in the new year. That's what we were told. Well, it's now past, or we're now into the fourth month of the year. We're into the second quarter. No sign of it. We have a Minister for Justice who, again, I, I wouldn't quite bet my house on this proposition, but I, I think if you if you, if you you had a few quid to spare uh, that you could afford to lose, a fairly decent investment would be in the idea that Helen McEntee will not be the Minister for Justice next week. Um, so uh, then you've got a new minister coming in. Is the new minister going to go through this piece of legislation, find the amendments, bring them forward? And what, what's uh, and by the way, once that happens, it then has to be debated all over again. Every single aspect of the legislation has to be debated as if it were new, because all these amendments have to be teased out. Any amendments that make it more palatable to the likes of you and me are going to piss off the likes of the Labour Party and the Social Democrats. But why would the government put themselves through that? Uh, only yeah. to end up in a mess like there is in Scotland. Because the same thing will happen there. They've had 4,000 reports of, of hate incidents in Scotland in the first week, um, most of which are, you know, the, the, the police are swamped by them. There's the, there's no real clarity on what hate even is in their legislation, which is the same problem with ours. I mean, you, you would have to be a masochist of the highest order if you were in politics in an election year to decide this was a good idea to proceed with. <laughs> well, you, you make a few you make a few positive noises to keep the NGOs in the background and say we're working on it it'll come, and, and then you say oh we just couldn't get to it in time sorry I mean th- I, I, I presume that's the strategy even though they'd be much smarter just to take it out and ritually set it on fire in front of the RTE cameras well you know one could one could dream dare to dream John dare to dream but maybe their new advisors will advise them to do just that well speaking of which they have a few don't they and guess where they came from I, I published a piece today. We're recording this as ever at eight o'clock on Thursday evening. I, I, I published a piece today, just going through the number of ex-journalists who are now advising this government, and it is incredible—the um, sheer numbers. Um, and they got a new one this week because Kira Phelan left the Examiner to become the uh, government's new assistant press secretary, where she will be working for the government press secretary, who is Chris Donahue, who is the former News Talk host of News Talk Breakfast with Ivan Yates from back in the day where they will be joined um, in government buildings by um, oh, a bunch of a bunch of other journalists as well. Um, so let's have a look here. Let's see who's in there. Um, we have Aidan Corkery of the former Sunday, of the Sunday Business Post is another government assistant press secretary working for the Greens. Paul Clarkson, the former editor of the Irish Sun, working for Fianna Fáil. Uh, the Minister for Health is served by Porrick Gallagher, who people might remember as the New Talk political editor, and Susan Mitchell, the former Sunday Business Post health editor. Um, the Business Post is also in the Department of Education, where Michael Brennan, the former political editor, advises Norma Foley. Uh, Niall O'Connor of the Irish Independent, uh, who once wrote a glowing biography of Leo Varadkar, now, now advises um, uh, Heather Humphreys. Juno McEnroe, former correspondent with The Examiner, is in with Catherine Martin. You whip Hildegard Nocton. She's advised by Paul Melia from the Irish Independent. Um, and uh, Sarah Barden of the Irish Times is another journalist going to work for Simon Harris. And that's not even all of them, but that's just a few. That is the sense, the sheer number of journalists who are now advising this government is incredible. And I don't blame them because the pay is better. But like I, I, the other thing that TD I was talking to during the week was basically saying to me is this is, this is breaking the relationship between the government and the grassroots and the political parties because the ministers are no longer listening to the parliamentary party, be it in Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael. All they're doing is listening to these ex-hacks um, and the grassroots aren't getting looking. That that was his diagnosis. And I think there's a lot to be said for it. I mean, I think that like ultimately, this, be, to be fair, I mean, there's relationships that develop because it's very difficult difficult for them not to between politicians and journalists. That's the that's the name of the game, right? And over time, I don't I, I, I do have sympathy for journalists and I think there's very few of us who would turn down the scale of pay increases that some of them would being would be being offered. But I think at the same time, you know, you'd have to be and you'd have to you couldn't be anything but deeply suspicious of the level of journalists who are now advising government and the lack of calling out that journalists have been doing of this government, the lack of real journalism. I mean, you you you, you complimented Fiona and Sheehan on this podcast a couple of weeks ago and we talked about it off air and I was saying that like one of the things I like about Fiona is, you know, that he has a, he, it's very obvious when you meet him and, he, you know, I hope he's not listening but if even if he is, you know, he's a bit grumpy. You know what I mean? He can be a bit, 
gruff. But at the same time, it's really obvious when you talk to him that he has a natural curiosity about people and why people think the way or feel the way they do about a certain thing. And I know he attends a lot of, of a big variety of issues. And he, it's really obvious that he is curious about who, who people are, why they, why they think the way they think. And I think that that's unfortunately becoming rarer and rarer in our journalists. And I can't help but wonder whether if that many journalists are moving over into government buildings and advisory roles for the government, you're not going to dirty your bib by slamming the government, by crucifying them on this issue or that issue, because you want to keep the relationship nice in the hopes that maybe at some point you'll be getting a job out of it. And that is a complete a, a, a complete breakdown in what we as the public should be getting in the level of accountability that journalists are getting from politicians. We're losing out there. And I do, like I said, I have sympathy for people who want to, you know, advance in their career, blah, 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 blah. But we're really losing out on, on the government being called out. And I think that this is a really big symptom of why. Well, for, before I agree with you, uh, with a slightly different focus, I just want to say about Fiona and Sheehan that what I said to you off air, I'll say on air, which is the reason I think he's a good journalist is because in back in the day when I used to be actually fronting press conferences for various organizations, he's literally the only journalist I've ever seen walk into a press conference where I went, ah, bugger, why does he have to be here? Because I, <laughs> yeah. because I knew he was going to ask me a really awkward question um, challenging the fundamental issue or whatever I was presenting, uh, yeah. which is what a journalist should do. Journalists should interrogate. Um, By the way, Speaking of which, speaking of which, another good example of that was Vincent Brown. And Vincent Brown used to just get like, you know, it was kind of like darkly comedic at times, but he didn't let people away. He didn't let politicians away with things. Yeah, and he was coming. And this is, I, I always say to people who criticise um, what we do at Grips because we're, we're very clear about the ideological perspective from which we come, is that it's a valid criticism, but Vincent Brown did the same from the opposite side and did it brilliantly. and And... And but was always open, which I think you have to be to the other side's ideas. And as long as you're intellectually honest or try to be intellectually honest about what you're saying and what the other person is saying, then that can be, I think, can be really productive. Um, yeah. But, you know, Vincent's was, was great. At chat. I mean, I mean I had somebody I was somebody who was a regular on his program for years and had a couple of uh, stand up rows with them on air and really enjoyed them because they were honest rows. They were about things that mattered. It wasn't stupid gotcha stuff. It was. I remember we had a, a re, there's an argument between me and him somewhere on YouTube about Cuban healthcare when I was very young and a little bit more idealistic. And you can take whatever side you want in that, but it's an honest argument that he was having where he was interrogating an idea and I was interrogating his. And I'm not trying to say I was anything like on his intellectual level or anything like that, but it was it was a useful, yeah, a useful exercise. Yeah, conversations and arguments worth having. And ultimately, I don't think a lot of those arguments are being had. We're not having the arguments worth having, like ideological, uh, two sides, two people, both on different ideological positions, arguing about something that matters, or, like and finding some, you know, somewhere in the middle. We're not doing that. We're doing, as you say, much more gotcha, government not being called out, pretending, uh, pretending to that, you know, certain realities are the reality ignoring the facts of the real reality, refusing to engage with people and calling them names. Like, where, where's the stand-up row about immigration? Where's the stand-up row about gender ideology? Where's the stand-up row about gender ideology in our schools? Where's the stand-up row about housing? There's no ideological positions anymore, and we should be getting that from our media. And with some exceptions, as we just discussed, we don't. And uh, this business of journalists advising politicians, what I really object to is the sort of power dynamics that are created between politicians and the media. Because if you cite the example, and I, I mentioned this in my piece today, like imagine, and this will never happen, but imagine it was me that was appointed today as a, as, as Simon Harris as assistant government <laughs> press secretary, if we could tolerate each other for two minutes. But um, And then imagine that it's me suddenly in that job, having been in the job that I am in now just a week ago, um, ringing up Ben Scallon and saying, Ben, there's a press conference today and, you know, you'd really owe me one. I'd really owe you one if you asked about this. Yeah. Um, and, and Ben, who's I, I would hope would have the integrity to say, bugger off, John, you don't work. I don't work with you anymore. I'm asking what I want. But he might not have. It'd be quite difficult for him to, for him to do that, I think, because, you know, I, I've been telling him what to not. Sorry, I've been, you know, basically his boss for the last four years. Yeah. Um, and then you appoint a senior journalist and then all the other young journalists who replace them are coming in to 
to talk to, to these people about government policy. It creates a kind of incestuous relationship in the media between government po- between government departments and journalists, which is obviously the intent of the politicians in appointing these people, but it is corrosive for journalism. Corrosive for it. Um, so what do and, you do then? Do you do you place rules around the time frame within which you can have been an active journalist before you can take that job? I think, I mean, there's obviously employment law considerations there, right? It's It's quite difficult... It's quite difficult to do that. Um, it would be quite, but when we do it in other circumstances, I mean, like for example, there's a there's there's lobbying regulations. I mean, the minister for health can't resign tomorrow and then become a lobbyist straight away and start talking to the people who are working from two minutes ago about you know hiring various contractors. There there are regulations around that. Um, I think there's a case for looking and seeing if there are regulations that can be enacted, but no one has any interest in doing it. I mean, the Sinn Fein get into office tomorrow; they're going to do the exact same thing, right? Yeah. Um, they're going to hire. They're going to hire journalists as well, um, and some of the old journalists who were working for this administration will then go on to the natural next step in the career. By the way, which we don't talk about enough, which is what you do when you've been a journalist and then you've got experience as a political advisor. Well, then you go to an NGO. You go and become the director of communications for the Irish TikTok, uh, the, the Irish, um, the, the Irish Table Tennis Association, or whatever. Um, and you get a taxpayer funded salary. But your there. salary again, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so so that's that's what happens, and very few of these people end up back in journalism because it's just a, a step on the career ladder to sort of what is now uh, in inverted commas communications career. Um, and that is that is corrosive. But I also think we're not talking about enough how damaging this is for politicians, because I mean you, you come from a political family, right? Your dad was a, a TD and MEP, a minister, all those things. Yeah. The most, I'm guessing that the most valuable feedback he would get on a day-to-day basis about how the government was doing wasn't from his special advisor in the department, but was from the common um, chairman in, I, I, in, I don't know, in Sandymount, going, uh, what the government's doing here is really pissing off people in the golf club or whatever. Yeah. I, 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 and that link is the one that's been broken. Like the, yeah. the, the organization of these political parties is completely atrophying, so they don't get that feedback. I, I, I made the point, uh, I think, on another podcast that I have now lived in rural North Tipperary for, for six years through several election cycles, and I have never had a Fianna Fáil or a Fine Gael canvasser um, come here, either during an election, during a referendum campaign, anything. And it's not so rural that like they would have to drive for miles. There are loads of houses on my road. It's just the organisation doesn't exist for those parties. Um, so they're not hearing the feedback of me and my neighbours. You know, and instead, they're listening to somebody who was in the DCU Madras of journalism for a few years, went to uh, the Sunday Business Post, um, wrote a few articles about who who was likely to get promoted in the reshuffle, and then became suddenly a ministerial advisor to I don't know the Minister for Social Welfare. What does that person know about welfare policies? Very little. What do they know about um, what might go down well with the editor of a newspaper? A fair bit, but it's not good for the country, um, and. And so that's, I think, that's an issue. Big time. And I think that we're we're, we're suffering enough. Like, uh, uh, to your point, I mean, I my dad and, and, and people of my dad's generation, they still have the kind of, and I noticed that I do it a bit as well. Like, I, they still have the kind of type, a few types of people that they ask about things or they hear from or they speak to that they take as a real barometer for, for how, you know, certain things are going. For me, um, I always used to take, extreme heat I still do of what taxi drivers in Dublin are talking about um, because I think it's usually quite reflective of what a lot of people are talking about and there's other people but you're 100% right that you know old school politicians never took what was their 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 heat from what journalists were were talking about or telling them what's going on on the ground we'll say and you know if, if anything the journalists were actually hearing from the politicians what the public were saying mm-hmm. that's gone I mean, you know, my dad was a TD, as you say, and, and the common and then, you know, like people in the local area, people in, in community centres, that kind of thing. Like that would all, there was a feedback loop there that worked quite well. And I think that's been broken for some time. And I think that journalists are, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a circle there of journalists, NGOs and politicians. And it's the reason why, for example, Simon Harris doesn't kill that bill, uh, the hate speech bill, in his first day and his first decision, because he's not hearing enough from Joe Public about what people really feel about that. Mm-hmm. Because he's been told by between the, he's sitting in on a on a comfortable couch between an NGO 
and a jur- and a journalist who's now his advisor telling them that everything's wonderful. Yeah. And if you're and if you're, you know, if your political nose isn't, you know, sophisticated enough to spot that, you know, those two referenda had 80 and 90 percent no boxes. Well, you're probably in a bit of trouble. Well, this is the thing. I mean, people who listen to this podcast in the run into those referendums will know that both Sarah and I spent weeks kind of basically scratching our heads and second guessing ourselves because everything we were hearing on the ground was overwhelming no vote. Couldn't find a yes voter. I think between us, we talked to one. You you met one, didn't you? But like, you met one, and I met none. I think. Okay. Fair enough. Um, no, I knew of one politician who was doing a yes and a no. Okay, um, but everything we were hearing on the ground was no, 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 and kept saying, and, and basically had a, this kind of on this podcast going, are we, are we, are we going mad? Like, are are we the ones who who are out of touch? Like. But no, it was the political class that was entirely, completely and totally out of touch. And I will never forget Leo Varadkar's face on the day of the count when he came to, very graciously, it should be said, in fairness to the man, concede yeah. defeat. But you could see that he was shell-shocked. And I don't think it is remotely a coincidence that he quit a week later or two weeks later, whatever it was. I really don't think that was a coincidence. And everything I've heard, by the way, um, suggests that wasn't a coincidence either. Um, so I, I, I don't... like. And, and again, it's a complete failure of, of political antenna. If you're a government and you don't get the feeling in the water that something is amiss, then, you know, something fundamentally has broken down. Because you might hate our politicians, and there are lots of people who listen to this who want to hear us basically talk about ideas, and we, we, you know, and that's fine. But on the assumption that people know where we stand, you still have to accept that the purpose of politics is for the people running the country to broadly be in touch with the people who live in the country. That's why we live in a democracy. That's the whole point of it, that they are supposed to be broadly representative of the majority views in the country, even if you or I might be in a minority on issues that the people running the country at least know, have a broad sense of where the public are. And what kind of weird utopia are you referring to, John? What are you talking about? Well, I, 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 I think, that, well, obviously we don't live in that, but that's, that's the ideal. That's what it's supposed to be. But over, and I do think it's gotten worse, by the way. I mean, I think Bertie Ahern, for all that one might, you know, whatever you think of Bertie Ahern, um, he he had his finger in the pulse of where the country was on various issues, which is why he won three general elections by, by in Irish terms, a landslide each time. Yeah. Um, Enda Kenny, to some extent, did as well. Um, of the, but, but I think that 2011 election was when it started to start to really slip away. And, and this kind of journalists as advisors, powerful NGOs started coming in. And basically over these last 12 years, that political antenna that our politicians used to have has totally gone to the extent that now on, on, on any number of issues, they are miles out of step with the public. I can't really think of an issue, a major issue that appears in that Irish Times monthly poll of what people are talking about, where the government is, on, is clearly on side with the majority of the public. I, I can't think of one. You could say the economy in broad terms, but what does that mean? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're not on side with the public and things. I mean, the, this week, for example, the exchequer returns are out, were out today. They were pretty good. And that happened in the same week that the government jacked up the taxes on diesel, diesel and petrol at the pumps, which yeah. is just pissing people off for no good reasons when it's not financially necessary to do it. What's that about? The climate change. <laughs> Yeah, but that's it, isn't it? I mean, it's it's this sense that it's this this sense constantly that there's stuff more important than the voters. That we live in a country where you know, yeah, it might it might screw um, a poor family down the country to suddenly go to the petrol pump tomorrow and find that they pay twenty euro more than they thought they would, and it screws up their whole week's budget. But that's nothing compared to what the temperature of the country might be two hundred years from now. But it's worse as well because it's like I'm actually doing this podcast from centre parks where I've, we've brought our kids. And um, because they're on their Easter holidays, and like, I'm not even going to say how much it costs to come to Centre Parks from Monday to Friday, but it's a lot, and it's more than a lot more than it would cost probably to go to Spain for the week. Um, but like, you know, you're just like the the like petrol and 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 all of that. Like, it feeds into the entire country, the cost of living, the cost of staying at home, going on holidays, using places that are in Ireland that create jobs and whatever. The Centre Parks is a great example of something that's in Longford, built, you know, 
in, a, in an area that probably didn't have a huge amount of opportunities for jobs for local, you know, local teenagers, or whatever. And now it does because of this. But the cost of it, the cost to get here is it's just limiting for people. Well, you told and, me what the cost was, and I will obviously spare your blushes, except to say that I went to Budapest last week for a week. I didn't have three kids with me, to be fair, but I know I paid less than you paid. Um, and but as, I, but as I go to the, but as I, you know, we get together the money, but we, as we go to the petrol station to get the petrol to drive down here, government just wants another wants another hack out of us. It's annoying. Yeah, and so avoidable. So yeah. avoidable. That's the the thing that that about it. anyway. And, and, and annoying as well, John, because I know that deep down, when I say the government, it's just the greens, the tail wagging the dog, all these green initiatives, like the Green Party, are just every like or not every. That's unfair, but like a lot of these really annoying. You know, you're all kind of stupid people who need to be told what to do. Things come and originate with the Green Party. They do. Well, something that isn't going to originate with the Green Party, let's give them a break. How do you feel, Sarah, about paying 20 billion euro a year for 20 years to have a united Ireland, which works out at 400 billion, which is in the Institute of Economic, uh, International and Economic Affairs report came out today suggesting that that would be the cost? Well, how do I feel about it? I think it's, I think it's, I think it's an interesting conversation to have because I think it means that we all have to put our big boy boots on and uh, have real conversations, as we just spoke about earlier on, where people come from different ideological position, positions. And uh, I mean, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure how I feel about it, but I, you know, maybe if we abolished half of our nonsense NGOs, I might be more up for it. But at the end of the day, the people I want to be asked that question is Sinn Féin. Well, they'll say it's not accurate, of course. I mean, it's one of those ones. I mean, uh, like, the first thing to say about this, I think, is that economics are not the driving factor for most people who care about the United Ireland one way or the other, right? I mean, I always say to people, like, if you were offered 20 billion a year, like, and a massive cut on your taxes, and the price was restoring the 32 county union with the United Kingdom, sending people to the House of Commons and kneeling for King Charles, would you do it? Um, And the the answer, obviously, for the overwhelming majority of people, including me, for the record, is no, you wouldn't do it because your your national identity is something that can't be bought or sold. You're you're Irish, right? You're not you're not you're not British, um, and the same the same is true in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and, and people need to understand that that for unionists in Northern Ireland, this isn't about. You're not going to say to a unionist, yeah, but it will benefit the Northern Irish economy if you unite with the South. They don't care because economics is not the the driving factor. Just as in this case, for people in Sinn Fein or People are, are, are the very, very many Irish people who aspire to United Ireland, regardless of being in Sinn Féin or not. Economics isn't really the issue. It's an emotional longing. It's a sense of healing a wound, bringing the two parts of the island together and moving into a shared future and all that good stuff. So um, on, on one level, I, I think that's important to recognise. But in recognising that, you have to recognise something else, which is all the people who will be out. We have a piece from Pat or Tobin tomorrow. Uh, which basically makes the case that these figures are wrong. And I mean, I, I listened to his argument about it, but you yeah. should also bear in mind that because it's an emotional longing, you have to remember that if this exact same report had come out today and people had said that it would make money, then the very same people criticizing it would be out advocating that a Nobel economics prize be awarded to the authors of the report because it, it's it's largely a political reaction you have. If it's good news, yay, we love the report. If it's bad news, uh, the report must be wrong. That is the... That's the natural reaction people have to these things. Um, So that's the first thing. But the second thing I would say about it is that I really think when we talk about this, all the focus is on two things. It's on sort of like the the economics and how to integrate unionists. And nobody is talking about what I think is a hugely unforeseen risk of United Ireland, which is the letdown that northern nationalists might feel in United Ireland. Just hear me out a little bit, Sarah. First of all, let's leave aside the obvious stuff, like, you know, what, what's your present for joining United Ireland? Oh, it's a migrant centre in Craigan. Um, <laughs> let's, leave that, leave, let's leave that out. But, but let's talk about um, the reality of, you know, you've, you've spent a century, more than a century, living in this Northern Ireland state that, in the words of David Trimble, had been a cold house for nationals. You, you invested cultural, political energy for, for the guts of a century in Irish unity and then it happens tomorrow and what happens your living standards fall because because you know the the 
we can't afford to invest. And the Dublin government, by the way, what's its priority going to be in investing in Northern Ireland? Is it going to be in nationalist communities that have been neglected for 100 years? Or is it going to be investing in the Shankill Road and wealthy unionist areas to show that actually um, unionists can be live happily in the United Ireland? Um, and then you've got all the political the, all the political and cultural stuff. I think there's a real possibility that the most destabilising force in the United Ireland will be northern nationalists who are very suddenly alienated by what they find because they've invested so much of their lifelong energy in believing that this will be a paradise and then they'll find that it's not. And, and if you're a northern nationalist, comment in the comments if you think I'm being offensive or if I'm being patronising because I don't mean it that way. I just think it's a real political issue that that nobody's talking about. I think there's tons of like real political issues that nobody talks about with this. The the the, the things that would will need to be conceded on our part being one. Do you know what I mean? Tricolors, national anthems, things like that. I mean, they they're just conversations that people that I know just don't want to face. Yeah, and the funny thing about them is that they don't even solve the problem. Like I, I, you see, I, this is the thing. I mean, Irish people will have this psychological breakdown about not a psychological breakdown. That's the wrong word. But like, it'd be a really massive thing for Irish people to give up the tricolor. Yeah. Nobody would want to do it, I, and I completely understand that. You're like I, you, you feel an attachment to that flag. It's it's our flag. We're proud of it. It's the one. I, you, I you feel know. a physical feeling when you even say it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's for me. It's for me that flag. And I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be flippant. That flag is like one of my earliest memories is Italian ninety, right? That's I was six in Italian. I was born in nineteen eighty four, so I was six in the middle of Italian ninety, and that was sort of my my awakening to the fact that I was Irish and it meant something. Yeah. And that flag is kind of in, in, you know that 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 that's sort of awakening. That's my identity. That's who I am. And then to to give it away for I don't know a harp or something, kind of just it 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 would feel like I was losing my country. Yeah. Um, but then you have to recognize it from the other side. <laughs> And I, I, again, like if you if you if you think about this from a unionist perspective, what are we saying to them? Oh well, we'll we'll give you we'll we'll, we'll change our flag and we'll change our national anthem to make you feel feel more at home. Imagine they said that to you. Imagine they said, Sarah Ryan, here's our deal to you. We'll get rid of God Save the Queen and we'll use uh, Land of Hope and Glory as the national anthem, and we'll put a tricolor onto the Union Jack. Now will you join the UK? What would your answer be? No. Of course it would. So I mean, it, and and I kind of think people down the down south, even when we're having these conversations, it's like we're not talking to unionists about what they want. It's like we're discussing amongst ourselves. Well, what 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 might we be prepared to give up? And the the answer is that we'd struggle even to give up the symbolic things that don't mean that much. Let alone, I mean, for me, everyone talks about the Commonwealth membership being an issue. I don't think that's it. I think it's it's stuff like NATO membership is a much more likely issue. Um, for people who want to feel part of the sort of family of nations that are in the West or want to feel like their influence in Ireland has changed. I mean, I think issues like neutrality are, are, are massive. Issues like education, I know from talking to unionists, uh, is, I mean, lots of conservative nationalists down south will be shocked to learn that a lot of northern unionists agree with Adon O'Reardon about Catholic education in the south. They believe that the massive influence of the Catholic Church in terms of patronage in the Republic is a massive issue that needs to go. Uh, they wouldn't be comfortable with it. They want a secular state. Um, so there's loads of stuff that we're not talking about in yeah. relation to that before we even talk about what nationalists might want. And then there's the cost. And at, the I, sa- at the same time, I think we'd both vote yes in the morning. Yeah, but we don't. The, the difference between us and, for example, as I said, Sinn Fein is that we. I think that the likes of you and I and a lot of people across the spectrum are much more realistic and much more honest about what is entailed in, in this kind of thing. And I don't think Sinn Féin are honest about this and, and nor have they been for quite some time. Like, I, 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 and they, they lead with it as a pillar upon which they, they you know, that they will, will govern Ireland and that they will achieve it and they'll do this and they'll do that. So when you get down to, and like, look, I take your point that Pater Tobin can come on tomorrow and, and argue about the specifics of the number. But in many ways, even if the number is wrong, the number is large. It can't really be argued much down much. And I think that politically, you know, and, and we'll get we'll get to this in a minute, but I, I think Sinn Féin are in, in free fall. But I think that this is very damaging for them as well, because unless they're willing to engage realistically with this as a concept, 
it makes them look like they're full of shite, basically. Yeah, and the, the problem is that they make an argument, uh, or and it's not just Sinn Féin, people who are eager for United Ireland make, a, make an argument, which I think is the strangest I've ever heard in, in, in all my years watching Irish politics. And the argument they make is that actually Britain will be responsible for a large number of these costs. That Britain will pay the pensions. That Britain will, you know, subsidise the public service. That Britain will pay a large part of the cost of withdrawing from Northern Ireland. And I mean, there, there, there are two things that strike me about that. The first is that I just at a sort of amusing level, I find it bizarre to hear people who have been arguing for uh, uh, more than 100 years that Britain is an occupying power in the North that is anti-Irish, that is suppressing our national identity, for those same people to suddenly be turning around and saying, well, actually, Britain is a really benevolent nation that will voluntarily pay for the restoration of Ireland. I mean, it's it's kind of contradictory to their national identity. You know, God save the king sort of stuff. And yeah. secondly, on a political level, it's very naive, because if you're sitting in London thinking about this stuff, and assuming that the sequencing is, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, th- uh, what I'm going to say is dependent on the idea that Northern Ireland were to leave the Union before Scotland attempted it again, which I think is is likely, looking at the, the current situation in Scotland where the SNP seems to be in difficulty. Um, but if you're in London and you know you're losing Northern Ireland, the last thing you want to do is lose Scotland as well, because losing Scotland probably means losing your G7 slot. It probably means losing your Security Council seat at the UN, a massive reduction in national prestige. You want to keep Scotland at all costs. And the biggest argument you have for Scotland is, well, look how difficult it was for Northern Ireland. So every incentive in London will be, um, no, if you leave, you're on your own. And fair enough, we're not going to keep you against your will, but off you go, enjoy your new country, but don't expect taxpayers in Essex to pay the pensions of people in Down Patrick in the Republic of Ireland, as it would be. So so I think that argument has not a whole lot to recommend it. And what's more, it, it, if I'm wrong and the Brits are feeling generous, so be it. Congratulations, well done. But if I'm right and they're not, what's your leverage? You know, if I'm right and, and you know, there's a British government that isn't particularly interested in doing what you say they have to do, what's your leverage over them? You don't have any. So, yeah, I think there are, there, there, there are lots of harsh realities that people have to think about confronting if they care about this issue. And, and I want to emphasize, the other problem is you can t- you talk about these issues, there's always a cohort who say that you're, you're, you're a unionist or you're a West British or you're somehow against Irish unity. I am not against Irish unity. I would vote for it. But I would yeah. vote for it with the reservations that this is not going to be easy and it's going to be bumpy. Because um, I think in the long term, the, the really convincing argument for United Ireland is the one that in the long term, as in 30, 40 years down the line, um, a united Irish economy would probably be stronger than having two separate ones from one island. Yeah. Uh, and you have to I, vote with the people. I think it goes back to the point you're making earlier on, which is like there are issues here that are, there are conversations here, arguments worth having, mm-hmm. you know, things worth being honest about, things, ideological questions that are worth thrashing out. And, you know, people need to be brave enough to have them. And, it, you know, it doesn't mean I'm the same as you. Like, it doesn't mean that you're not a Republican that you wouldn't like to see United Ireland. But you can also ask questions about it. Yeah, and I think, and in fairness, I'll give Sinn Féin credit on this, which is that one thing, one of the ways they've changed over the last 20 years is that they are now, I think, in all fairness, consciously trying to send a signal that they believe unionist people in Northern Ireland are, are, are Irish, but not not that they're not British, but like that they are, they're welcome and that they'll be respected in the United Ireland. And that's a good first step, but it's, it's a very small first step. I mean... If you accept that the, a border poll will pass in the morning, which is no sure, in fact, it's unlikely that it would, but let's assume that it would, you're still going to have a million culturally unionist orange people living in our country who celebrate the 12th of July, who consider themselves um, British, loyal to the crown, all those things. I mean, this conversation cannot happen without talking to those people about what they want, not to win the referendum. I mean, I think we all accept the principle that 50% plus one is a majority, and that has to be respected. But there's also what happens after that vote, which is the last thing we want is a repeat of what happened for 30 years when nationalists found, felt themselves downtrodden in Northern Ireland, except with unionists this time. Um, so you have to have those conversations to to try and ensure that, you know, if the vote goes against unionism, what can we do to make them feel less bad about the result? 
That's a, that's a necessary conversation. That's not a conversation about trying to give them a veto or anything like that. It's a conversation about what happens the day after, I think. Well, time will tell. I'm curious to see how Patrick Tobin talks these da- talks these figures down. Well, I don't want to the spoiler. I read the piece, but uh, I think I think he's uh, well. I haven't I haven't read it recently enough to to fairly summarize his argument, so I won't. But people can read it uh, today because you're listening to this from Friday, probably um, on on Grip.ie and see what he see what he has to say. Um, but in fairness, I don't think he's being unreasonable. Um, anyway, um, you saw a tweet of mine about Donald Trump and wanted to talk about it. I did. Um, well, I just we haven't checked in on our American cousins at all lately and how that's going. Um, how uh, well. I can't remember now. Was your prediction? We've had this conversation on the podcast before. Is your prediction that Donald Trump gets elected or no? My prediction is Joe Biden wins the election. Yeah. So I think my prediction was that Trump wins. So your, um, your tweet was about how he's faring in rural versus urban, wasn't it? Actually, how he's faring in suburban America. So basically, I mean, the 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 the, the contours of American election are Joe Biden is going to win the cities by 60, 70 points. Like places like New York, he's going to win eighty percent of the vote, um, and then Donald Trump is going to win rural America, places like Wyoming, by a similar margin. So these elections are basically decided where you live, Sarah, in the suburbs, um, where you know people are kind of middle income. It's not they're not living in in tenements in the inner city, but like they're they're basically white collar professional people who who you to work and broadly speaking, upper middle income. Like that that's college educated, those are the voters who decide American elections or have basically for the last five or six presidential elections. And in the Marist poll published this week, uh, Joe Biden is winning by 57 to 43, um, which I think is... Why do you think that is? Well, it's a culture war, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the contours of the culture war, um, both here and in America, the, the broad, broad the basic principle is the more educated you are, the better off you are, the more liberal you are. And what's yeah. more, what's more, I, I don't even think it's just about that. It's the more sort of class conscious you are and the more the more sort of status matters to you and the status of your opinions. And it's like what we were talking about with J.K. Rowling at the start of the program, but how a lot of people who like would be in our demographic might feel afraid to say the things that she says, not because of any legal fear, because out of social consequences. And I think Donald Trump, if you're talking about social capital in terms of what is the what is the the respectable vote, which I think matters an awful lot to people, the people I'm describing, I I, I think Donald Trump has a respectability deficit uh, that that is much more important than people who support him realize. They don't realize how important it is, and it is it is it is one of the most powerful. Um, tools to, to appeal to swing voters. I mean, we talk in, in terms of our referendum recently about the massive landslide. What was the contribution of Michael McDowell in that? Was yeah. it the arguments he made or was it that people across the country could say to their friends, well, I agree with Michael McDowell, which is a whole lot more respectable than saying I agree with, um, and in fairness, I, I, David would admit this, but it's more, a lot more respectable than saying I agree with David Quinn. Um, yeah. And I think that that's a crucial factor. And I don't see who Trump has in his camp who can play that Michael McDowell role to middle America and say, um, well, you know, this guy's voting for him. So I think it's a perfectly respectable thing to do. I think the respectability gap is something that people on our side of the fence, by which I mean, I mean, you know, if there are Donald Trump supporters in Ireland, a larger proportion of them are listening to this podcast than a lot of others. Um, and I, I don't think enough of them pay attention to it. And and they might be howling at their at their phones or wherever they're listening to this at what I'm saying. But you know, I, I think it's I think it's it's really important. And I think that a lot of this stuff with with Trump I I actually would say to people that people say, what's my issue with Donald Trump? I think a lot of his policies were fine to good. Fine to good. Very few bad policies. But his politics in terms of in terms of you know He's never gotten above 46% of, of the vote in America for a reason. And that reason isn't the vote being rigged. It is that there is a there's a solid majority of Americans who don't like the man. And that matters. Yeah, I mean, I think you and I have discussed this on not on the podcast before, but like I'm kind of the same in that, you know, there was all this 
scaremongering before Donald Trump got elected the first time and he was going to do this, start a war and he was going to do that. One of the least interventionist presidents ever. You know, like that. All, none of that played out. Now you hear people saying, oh, well, if he gets in this time, they'll start a war. I, my issue with Donald Trump is that I think he seems like a jerk. Like, yeah. Does not he doesn't seem like a nice person, and that matters. He seems like mean, and you know, just a kind of a the kind of guy who you could go for a meeting with, seem real nice in the meeting, and then go out on TV afterwards and say he thought you were an idiot. You know, this kind of person. Just like there, there's a problem there. The thing that I think he has going for him, though, is regardless of whether you like him or not, is that I think that this thing is still there's a lot. There's a lot more chapters to this story before the election. And there's things like the debates. Uh, and I think that the debates really matter in America. And I think debate like elections have been won and lost on those debates. And I think Biden is going to be really, really poor. Although he, the thing is, so many people expect him to be really, really poor. And Trump does this thing so much about how Biden can barely walk upright. That kind of he's setting the bar so low that if Joe Biden comes out and just like... Um, says his name correctly. There's there's a real risk that the average American could go in as bad as I thought. Um, so it could go either way. But could... but but you know and I know that a lot of those. Yeah, you're right. He comes out and it becomes a good soundbite that he gets one good sentence against Trump that gets replayed over and over and over again. But sometimes you know, like whether you like Trump or not, and like I've had, I mean. Regard, like I said, regardless of whether you like him or not, some of the most comedic things I've ever seen in politics in my life have been Donald Trump. Whether he's trying to be hilarious or he he's not, you know, or he's just got a kind of a way. When he was debating against Hillary, and she said, "Do you really want Donald Trump to be in charge of the law?" and he says, "Because you'd be in jail." I mean, that's one of the best responses. Whether you like him or not, in our I got the team. It is. It, it it was extraordinary. It was it was it was a brilliant moment. And the I problem is I problem is people people forget that in the twenty twenty debates he was terrible. Yeah. People forget that obviously like he was trained. terrible. Hmm? He's obviously, you know, gotten some coaching or gotten some training, but he's also sometimes really funny. You know, he said some things that are do you remember when he was being asked um was it Megan? Megan Kelly asked him about you know you've called women this this what slobs whatever and he says only Rosie O'Donnell. I mean, <laughs> I've just got that many times in political when I've watched the political debates where I've spat my drink all over myself. I mean, it's very offensive to Rosie O'Donnell, but like just very memorable. And there's a, well, there's he, an audience he, for that. He's the opposite of political correctness distilled uh, into a human being, isn't he? Like that that's the. That is a large part of his appeal. A large part of Trump. Like I, I found um, the best bit of the twenty sixteen election was the Irish Times the next day. Like yeah. that—that's the argument for voting for Trump. That is yeah. the argument. I mean, they're, they're like I don't know how different the Irish Times page on the day after the twenty sixteen election would have been if there had been a Martian invasion that had wiped out half the world's population overnight. I don't know that it would have been any more mournful. It was it was like the end of the world, and that was enjoyable in a way. Um, and 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 and, and the, their tactics now, John. So like we know from the lack of any kind of mention really of what's going on with this in Scotland with the hate speech bill, they just won't won't mention. So if Donald Trump gets elected, they'll probably just the front of the Irish Times the next day will probably just run a story about you know the increase in housing or something, hmm. and just but, not acknowledge it. But yeah, I, so I think I think that that is his appeal. He has he has another ability which is incredible, which is the ability to make his his diehard supporters feel good. But I I just think that there's a solid majority of Americans who don't like Donald Trump. I've never voted for him. Will never vote for him. Do vote. His his victory in 2016 was a couple of thousand votes in a couple of thousand states while losing the popular vote to Hillary Clinton. Um, he came close to pulling it off in 2020 again, but. You know, but we haven't talked about Joe Biden, though. I mean, Joe Biden is terrible. I mean, lest anyone think that I'm sitting here kind of going, you know, I'd love four more years of Joe Biden. Joe Biden's terrible. He's, he, he, I mean, and some of the, we talked about, you know, if he only stands up and says his name in the debates. The reason the expectations are so low is because, I mean, if you watch this guy, he looks like a walking corpse and sounds like one. 
and and is presiding over a terrible economy, multiple wars, absolute chaos. The American southern border is is a, a, a full blown crisis zone. Um, so I mean, it, 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 in some ways, if Donald Trump can't win this election, it'll be the biggest missed opportunity by the Republican Party in living memory. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he would have won the last time if COVID had never happened. He would have won. He came very close. And and I think that you know my issue is that people consistently, you know, underestimated. There was like it was laughable that he would receive the nomination the first time. Then he did. Then it was laughable that he would win. Then he did. Do you know what I mean? And so on and so on. Like he has an amazing ability to kind of to you know exceed people's low expectations. Uh, of him. Yeah, but yeah, no. This is where we disagree. Donald Trump won one election in 2016. Everyone said, "Oh, it's amazing! He won the election." No one said he did. Ha ha. ha. The Republican Party got tonked in the 2018 midterms, lost but lost their majority in both houses. He lost in 2020, um, and the Republicans lost in Congress. 2022, there was supposed to be a red wave. Republicans were going to sweep the board against Joe Biden. They took the House of Representatives by like three seats and didn't even take the U.S. Senate. Like they have underperformed in every single election, bar the first one, since Donald Trump became the leader of the party in 2016. That is undisputable. And when you, if you're somebody listening to this and kind of going, oh, but they rigged, rigged the elections, rigged the elections. Well, why didn't they rig the first one? Yeah. Like, like uh, you, you know, at some point you've got to wake up and, 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 and realize that there are downsides to nominating this guy as well. And by the way, if he if he was to win this election, know what you're looking forward to in, in two years' time, which is after two years of this guy being the center of attention all the time and exhausting people, which is what he does, by being in the news every single day, Democrats are going to win in 2026, and you're likely setting yourself up for a Democratic president in 2028. Um, and then it's just a matter of what you get over the next four years that, that makes that worthwhile. So that is that is is all all the reasons there uh, where people can shout at me and say that you know I'm terrible, but all those reasons why I'm not Trump enthusiast. But I mean, it's also the case that in Ireland we we we. We love to talk about, you know, and particularly our journalists love to talk about American politics and American this and American that. And like, I know it's a it's a cliche point to make, but it's worth making because it's true and that America is not just New York and, you know, Florida and Miami or whatever. It's like a lot of countries tied together in many ways. I mean, the difference in the reasons why people vote in Montana is completely at odds with why the people vote in San Francisco and so on and so forth. And that seems like an obvious thing, but we're, we're big commentators on American politics in Ireland, but we don't live in Ireland. We don't are in America. We don't pay taxes in America. We don't really have our finger on the pulse of the cultural reasons why people in America are, 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 aren't voting a certain way. And I think that Donald Trump appeals to a type of American that are a, a type of America that a lot of Irish people just don't really understand. And don't, but I think don't, a, gr- a growing number of them are understanding it, Sarah. Sorry to interrupt. I think a growing number of us are understanding it because if you're voting for Donald Trump, what are you voting against? You're voting against the same kind of issues that we have in Ireland, right? You're voting against uncontrolled migration across the Mexican border. You're voting against all this bullshit with sex education in schools becoming basically porn uh, taught by teachers. You're you're, <laughs> you're voting against, um, as we talked about at the start of this show, male rapists in women's prisons. You're you're voting against the bastardization of our language. You're voting against all that stuff. And that is why I don't blame anybody who says to me, I'm Trump true and true, because he, he stands against a lot of stuff that is annoying a lot of people and that Western politicians um, stand full square behind. Like he is, I, I describe him as a walking antidote to political correctness. He's also a walking middle finger. And, and that's a really powerful thing to be in politics. And, and it's what Sinn Féin had in Ireland up until about five minutes ago being a walking middle finger. But the problem is they've forgotten that and now and now voting for Mary Lou feels like voting for the establishment instead of what it was like a year ago, which was, you know, pissing everybody off by voting Mary Lou. But isn't that fascinating? I mean, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in Sinn Féin kind of parliamentary party or Sinn Féin str- strategy meetings. They must be just sitting there thinking to themselves, "What what's happened here now? And how do we, what are we going to do? Because I feel, I've said this before on the podcast, I was speaking to somebody about it today. It's like, it's not just slipping away from them. It's like sand through their fingers at the moment. 
I don't what? have the same sense. During the referendum, I mean, obviously, I had this, this, the sense and you had the sense that it was slipping away from the yes side dramatically. Um, I have a confession to make, which is I don't know many Sinn Féin voters. I mean, I'm I, sure I do, but like, it's 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 just I, I don't know many people who are diehard, died in the wool shinners. And those that I do kind of like, like, like Matt Tracy, my colleague, the former Sinn Féiner, hasn't been for a while. He's not a good, he's not a good, a good sort of um, wind vane on this. But you, ha- you've loads of contacts in sort of like Sinn Féin strongholds in the in inner city Dublin. Are you getting the yeah. sense it's slipping away from them? One hundred percent, one hundred percent. There's a big, big problem uh, for them. I think it's it's not just slipping away. It's and it's not just a, a disinterest or an indifference. It's anger. It's an anger that they, in a nutshell, this is m- my words. I think that there's a lot of Sinn Féin, former Sinn Féin voters who felt like they were led up the garden path of uh, by Sinn Féin, that Sinn Féin were different, the, you know, they're, that they were the symbol of change, they were the vote for change. And I think that they feel very betrayed already before Sinn Féin has even gotten in. This is the this is the mad thing that Sinn Féin weren't on their side on immigration, weren't on their side on the uh, on school gender ideology, weren't on their school on their side on the referendums and have just basically that have been, you know, pardon the pardon the irony of this statement, but addressing themselves up as one thing when they're actually something else. Yeah, I have to say, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, I, I click on the obviously wait till this is finished. Don't cut me and Sarah off, but click on the grip button underneath the underneath the video and look at Ben's video that he did this week on Sinn Fein and the hate, hate speech bill. Or if you're not watching this on YouTube. Go to YouTube and watch that video. And I, I'm not I, people who listen to this podcast know that I do not use it usually to promote grip content, and normally I wouldn't. But this time, this one is worth your watch because he just goes through their contortions over that piece of legislation, and he's too polite to say it. I'm not. Goes through each and every one of the lies they have told the public about their position on that legislation, telling people that they're against it now because they issued amendments. That, that weren't accepted. Those amendments that they, int- they introduced there were to make it worse. They, they wanted to make it a hate crime to say something yeah. offensive about a migrant and not even, not even uh, you know, like something that might be perceived as insulting should be a crime and should go to prison. They're now trying to present those amendments that were rejected as like trying to make the bill better. It is just the most dishonest. And, and Ben takes them apart in the most professional. And I, I was so proud of him for that video because it was kind of opinion led journalism of the best, of, of, in its best sense, where he basically said, Look, let's go through this and see what they said. And um, it, it, I, I, I would love every voter to watch it. Obviously, they won't. I, I think I think 60 or, 000, 60 or so thousand people have watched it across all platforms so far. But watch it because if you're thinking about voting Sinn Fein, um, and you may still vote Sinn Féin after you watch it and I'm not saying that you shouldn't but if you are thinking about voting Sinn Féin be aware that no politician ever um, is going to is going to be honest with you all the time but I think as well that you know when 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 we're talking here when we were speaking on this podcast a couple of weeks ago you were talking about how because Sinn Féin had such a poor local elections the last time that it was almost impossible for them you know not to make big gains Okay, fine. On the numbers, they might make some gains, but I think that they're really heading into something quite catastrophic. Mm. The um, other thing that we learned from the referendum is that the polls don't always capture what happens late in the campaign. I mean, there was no poll that showed the no side winning those referendums, and it was a, it was a whopping landslide. Now, the one thing I would say is that I was looking through Professor Adrian Kavner from Maynooth has a, a great resource where he goes through all the candidates who've been declared. And for all this talk about like sort of like independence, there aren't that many. There are a lot of places in the country where you, you actually don't have the opportunity to vote for, as of yet, an independent Ireland or an A2 or a, you know a, another party um, yeah. or an Irish Freedom Party. So so that will have to change for them to be really damaged, I think, or for the establishment to be really damaged. But that said, I do think there is the potential, which I wouldn't have said a, a month ago, for the Sinn Féin vote to absolutely collapse and you only to get 15 or 15 percent of the local election. That's a possibility now that I wouldn't have thought, but it's there. Yeah, I mean, as it stands now, unless things start to change, I, I mean, I, I said it last time, and I think they should have just come out and said that they re- they reflected and changed their mind on the hate speech bill, not on this wishy-washy thing. But I think that they are, you know, and in, in any campaign, you know this as well as I do, that you know, you want you want to be you want to be leading. You don't want to be 
uh, kind of chasing after every story. And that's what's happened to them. They're now react in reaction mode, all reactive mode all the time. They're responding to what they're being told is the news. They're responding to what be, being asked what their position is on the latest thing. They're not directing anything. They're not leading anything. It's a big, big problem. And it's 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 a there's a when a momentum gets behind that kind of position, that kind of situation, should I say, for a party or for a candidate in a campaign, it's really hard to stop. Like, how does Sinn Féin turn that around? How do you that you're hurtling down a hill? How do you stop stand well, yeah. and turn the other way? There's a difference between losing support, you can win support back, and a difference between losing credibility. And I yeah. feel like Sinn Féin are losing credibility. When you lose credibility, it doesn't matter if you change your positions because they're no longer credible. People don't believe that they're sincerely held. People don't trust you anymore. And if you lose credibility, uh, Fianna Fáil lost credibility on the economy in 2011 and have never won it back, for example, and and went from a party that wins 40% of the vote, vote in every election since it was founded, basically, to a party now struggling in the mid-teens. Um, so, so once you lose credibility, it's, it's almost impossible to win back. Anyway, somebody else has to win credibility, of course, which is another thing that hasn't happened. Um, we yes, should say, we should say, I promised somebody on the podcast last week because we were annoyed that we didn't mention the fact that actually you can see the seeds of this. Like the most recent opinion polls uh, showed a significant increase in the AIM2 vote. They were up to like 5% or something, which was un- unthinkable a year ago. And I yes. do want to say that. Um, and I know there are others, and we're not party political on this, and, and there's no way to candidate in my area. There's an independent Ireland candidate who I'll probably vote for in the election. Um, but I do think Patrick Tobin has to be given immense credit for the way he has stuck with it and grown that party's support to the point where it's now you know, likely to be bigger in terms of votes than Labour and rivaling the Social Democrats at the election. That's insane. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, you know, well, I know what your views on labour are. We, we... Dare to dream again, John. Dare to dream. Yeah. Um, no, I have so, so, so much time for Patrick Tobin. I really do. I have for a long time. I think he's smart. I think he's, you know, he's he's got his finger on the pulse of the right issues. So much time for him. So I think he did, and I think he works really hard, and I think he deserves it. Um, but I think that, I think that the his his running for Europe is an odd move. Um, it's an odd decision to make but anyway it is what it is I think if a and have the candidates I think they will do well but I think Independent Ireland now have a lot I mean I, I follow a lot of their social media streams and they're announcing candidates every day mm. um, and I think that they're going to try and feature in as many areas as possible and I think there's a huge appetite growing there for people to vote for the likes of a and or Independent Ireland and because, you know, as I was just saying a minute ago, you're right that Sinn Féin have lost credibility. But one of the other things that they've lost is they've lost an identity and the identity of being the party of change. That's and, that, the- and that provides opportunities, too, for I mean, in fairness to the Irish Freedom Party, who we hardly ever talk about on this podcast because they're, they're not elected. They haven't won any elections They're They're not a political force in the country as of yet. But to their credit, they've got a load of candidates. Um, and, and this is shaping up to be the kind of election where, where an organisation like that could surprise either. And, you know, I know there are people who listen to us who who, who are planning to vote that way as well. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, decisions are made by who shows up. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a massive opportunity there for people if they're just sensible and go out to talk to voters in a reasonable way to uh, to make a big impact, whether it be Ain't You Independent Ireland or anybody else. Um, and... I think the local elections, uh, again, I, I mentioned twice the politician who I was talking to during the week. It was a long conversation. And one of the things he was saying, this is what he, I'm, I'm, I'm reporting, now, I'm not endorsing what he said, Sarah, but I think it's important to, to give you a sense. He was saying that he was now thinking about the next doll having like 40 to 50 independents or smaller party TVs represented in it. And from his perspective, coming from the sort of Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael establishment, I'll not be more specific than that. He said that that would be a nightmare for the country because we wouldn't be able to form a government of any kind. And I think he has a point, but I also think it's their own fault. It is their own fault. And also, you know, there is a kind of a, like, obviously it's not like, it's not what you would want that, for example, we have a general election and then, you know, we spend six months 
trying to negotiate a programme for government, it fails and then we have another general election. Obviously, that's not ideal. But as you said, it's their own fault. Like the, the, they have to ask themselves questions about whether, whether, you know, whether they're managing the situation of the country and listening to the voters. They're not. We know they're not. There's more focus on nonsense things than there is on real thing, real issues, real bread and butter issues that matter to people. And so if Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, and, you know, we'll put Sinn Féin to the side for a second, but if it was Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael that they, you know, managed to get enough TDs elected to be serious contenders in formulating a government with the 30, 40 independents to get elected, well, maybe that's to kick up the arse that they need. But at the same time as well, like, the, you know, it, it's the, it's it's another issue with that that I have is it's the kind of framing of it. And I'm not, I don't know who you're talking to, just, you know, I don't know who it is that you're referring to that you spoke to. So it could be a Fianna Fáil or it could be a Fianna Gael or fine. But like, it's still coming at, it's still coming at it from that position that they came at the referenda with the exception of Leo afterwards, which is the kind of like, oh, people just don't understand what they're doing and people just need to be better advised about you know why they should vote for us? No, it's you. Well, that's you. not what he. That, that's not in fairness. To the, in fairness to the man, and I'll say he was a man. That's not what he was saying. Uh, he was despairing, despairing of the state of his party and the state of the government. Um, well, then do something about it, though, because like the, the thing about it is, is it's like it's like your Willie O'Dees and you're this coming out and saying, oh, well, now we need to go back, or you know, Michael rings or whatever. We need to go back to the grassroots, and we need to go back to Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael being this or Fianna Gael being that or whatever. Yeah, but you'll do nothing. You'll sit there on Twitter and go on interviews and say, we need to be more of this. But when push comes to shove, you'll nod along with what's going on. You won't leave. You won't complain. You'll just do it. So, frankly, shut up. Well, if you're listening, my friend, I think Sarah makes an argument that is hard to rebut, I'm afraid. But we'll have to leave it there because we've gone well over an hour, which I'm sure some people will be delighted by and some people have switched off. Sorry for them. You missed Sarah's rant. Um <laughs> earlier than that but I, we won't detain you any longer thank you so much as ever for listening to us and uh, allowing us to entertain you with our thoughts on the various issues of the week uh, as ever post your annoyance uh, on in, in YouTube we do read the comments uh, don't read them all out but we do read them take the feedback on board and uh, we will see you once again next week for another edition of the week that really was until then from Sarah and from me have a great week <laughs>